Okay. Uh, I'm going to conclude this series. We've been kind of staying uh, the book of Jonah. So if y'all don't mind, uh, we're going to go to Jonah chapter 3. Is that okay? Uh, I think we can, we can close out this, this minor prophet, but I believe that there's still some preaching material embedded in his story. Jonah chapter 3. I'm reading from the King James Version. You may find these words. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. And now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way, from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell when God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works. But they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. For a few moments with your prayers, I'm going to tag this text one more game. One more game. One more game. One more game. Let us pray. Father God, touch now, yes, sir. Remove me from this place, replace me with your spirit. Let a word come forth that allows us to leave different from the way that we came. Be so careful, God, to give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we approach uh, Valentine's Day, um, I'm reminded in this story, I like to listen to old couples who uh, talk time to time. And uh, this wonderful old couple tells the story where the husband was driving in his old car, old antique car. The wife says, baby, I remember we used to ride this car. You used to have your arm around me the whole time and wouldn't let me go. What happened to those days? He turned and looked at her and said, well, hold on, baby. I ain't moving. <laughs> you could have still been there. My arm has always been there. I never moved. The wonderful thing about that is that's the context of how God is. Yeah. As we sit there and we talk great detail about, God, I can't hear you. I wasn't there. You know, I feel your presence. And he said, I ain't yeah. uh -huh. I was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. So here it is. If you miss that connection, why don't you get back into my presence? Yeah. So what we see in Jonah chapter 3 is this manifestation of a consistent God with an inconsistent servant. Thanks be to God that God doesn't change, which gives us an opportunity to change back to him. Such is the discipline discovered in the discourse of Jonah chapter 3. And it reads in verse 1, the Lord came to Jonah a second time. That's the first shout. <laughs> that, 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 that alone is the whole glory of the God that we serve, whom we are introduced to through the life of Jonah. That, that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Okay, I'm only talking yeah. to the second time saints. Yeah. This is the second time saints. If you're still working on your first time, God bless you. Keep living. The rest of us who needed a second time, we can shout right there at the Lord. Take the Jonah a second time. It says, Arise, go to Nineveh and preach to them what I tell you to preach. That's the introduction of the book in Jonah chapter 1, revisited in chapter 3. Because that's how we open chapter 1. And the Lord came to Jonah. Say, go preach what I told you to do. Yeah. Fast forward to chapter 3. And the Lord came back to Jonah a second time. 
and said, go preach when I told you to preach. Yeah. And, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Can I tell you what that means, church? It means, first of all, if the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, that God is compassionate and committed uh, to people who aren't committed to him. Amen. And if God sent the message a second time, he is reestablishing Jonah's purpose in the earth. That God can choose not to give up on you even though you gave up on him. Okay. Uh -huh. He can not give up on you even though he knows the truth about you. It also says to us something else that's interesting. That when we come to Jonah a second time, he never brought up no, 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 no. He never, he never brought up the whale. Never, never brought up the whale rebellion. He just said, listen, arise, go tell what I told you to tell. Uh, he showed a second time. He went back to chapter one, never brought up chapter two. Chapter two speaks for itself. <laughs> Says something powerful to us that God knows how to reestablish your focus without revealing your failure. It's good. I need to hear that sometimes. That God is the God of one more game. One more time. Because he already knew you was going to mess up the first time. That's good news. Now, the crazy thing about how God knows you. You ever notice that? God knew you was going to mess up the first time. But what would people think of you if they saw you in your glory and knew what God knows about you? No, no, no. Think about that. They knew what God knows about you. No, no, no. They see you up. You, know, you, you, you preaching that. Mm -hmm. But they know what God knows about you. No, no, child. You singing in the choir, lifting up, holding hands. But they know what God knows about you. Okay, okay. Y'all don't want to testify. That's all right. That's because you know they don't know what God knows about you. <laughs> God has a way of making your voice credible even after your failure. You and I know about the whale rebellion, but the people of Nineveh don't. All they know is that God sent a prophet, and this prophet is speaking, and his mouth is representing the mouth of God himself. Preach what I told you to preach. Because I did not give up on you when you gave up on me. See, I could have acted towards you kind of how you acted towards me, but I'm a faithful God, and your disobedience does not uh, dictate my despondency. So God came to Jonah a second time. Here it is. He didn't change the preacher. He, he didn't change the message. And he didn't change the audience. He just came a second time. Which means that if Jonah gets a second chance to do the right thing, what he messed up, it further explains Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. I need you to go back and read, read this. It says, and God had prepared the fish. Y'all remember that? Yeah. And the had prepared so here it is. The fish also vomited Jonah up on dry land, which meant that God had already orchestrated a fish to be yep. in the same vicinity of the boat. Yep. He knew exactly when he was going to go overboard and it instructed the fish in then turn to be on its way to dry land. So if the fish was on the way to dry land before Jonah even got on the boat, it was all orchestrated before. That's why he said he had prepared a fish. God knew you was going to be right there. God knew. Well, he's going to find you in God knew exactly what he would have to deliver you from before you got in. And even in the midst of that, he preserved you. That what you thought swallowed you was preserving you. I, I, I need somebody to testify. I, I want to thank God. Because technically, um, he had to go down to Nineveh. But um, instant piece is he got a free ride. <laughs> they said that it was a three day journey <laughs> and he didn't preserve me from the enemy he preserved me from myself that, 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 that's who he preserved me from from me cause, cause, cause I could testify every now and again it's me who I need saving from anybody ever been there it's my own devices that I need to be saved from. It's not outside factors. It's inside factors that are working. And I need God to deliver me from me. God came to him a second time with the same word for the same church, for the same purposes. Tell them what I told you to tell them. He goes to Nineveh. The Bible says around verse 5, he preaches this one sentence prophecy. 
actually the only prophecy in the entire book of Jonah. He called a minor prophet for a reason. Well, they have one prophecy. It's the only one. Right there, verse number three and four, it says, we have grounds to believe that theologically there may be more that was said, but they summed it up like this. It says, look, uh, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The reason why we have grounds to think, I mean, you'll just show up. Yeah, y'all going to die 40 days. See you later. <laughs> that, that, that's what it said. That, that he just came, prophesied, that, that, that was it. That's the only prophecy in the entire book. That's not impressive. That sermon is not impressive to me at all. But I tell you, what is impressive? The response to the sermon. The response is the miracle of the sermon. There are, these are Gentile people, which means, uh, theoretically, they are polytheistic, meaning they serve many gods. But the Bible says when God's preacher got there with the word of God, Folk who didn't know God, didn't have a relationship with God, broke down in sackcloth and ashes and proclaimed consecration to God. Here's my question. How do folk who don't know God know how to fast? I'm just asking questions here. This doesn't make sense. How does somebody who ain't never been to church all of a sudden know what to do? Uh-uh. There, there, there is this understanding that when they got into sack and ashes, sackcloth and ashes, that's uh, this, this is a moment that represents grief and remorse. This is what it means, and I know they're gonna get into it on Wednesday when we do Ash Wednesday and we'll talk about it. But this, this whole motion is a sign of grief and remorse. The first thing that we see in the text, if you won't write notes and keep notes here, it is the seed of repentance. Somebody say the seed of repentance. The seed of repentance is the word of God. He sent the preacher with the word of God, and the word of God, church, has the potential to pierce and penetrate the most wicked of hearts. Jeremiah chapter 23 uh, and 29 says, It's not my word, it's not my word like fire, saith the Lord. It's not like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. That's what it said about the word of Jeremiah. Ephesians 6 and 7, Paul, uh, Paul says that the word is a sword. Take that sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 4 and 12 says the word of God is quick and powerful and stronger than any two-edged sword. I'm just talking about the word of God. So, so here he is. The word is not a tickler. Sorry. No, no. The word is... It, it's a sword that will cut you. The word is a hammer that will break you. The word is fire that will burn you. That's the word. Because sometimes the word of God might not make you shout. Might make you say ouch. Because the word of God ought to hurt you. The word of God ought to punch you. The word of God ought to penetrate you. It ought to break you down from your hard-heartedness. That's why we say, say amen in church, so we don't know the word talking to you. I'm just saying. <laughs> the word of God. Uh, the word of God. Uh, th th this is the same word that we saw Paul have on that road to Damascus. Yeah. It's the same word that it, it penetrated you. You used to be me. But the word of God transformed you. Uh, so, Sister Ruby, this morning, let me tell you, um, my iron preached to me. It did, it did. I was, I was iron clothes and my iron preached to me. I, if y'all never heard the sermon from the iron, let me go ahead and give you the clip notes. Uh, so as I'm sitting there ironing the clothes, I, I realize that there are certain situations, in order to straighten you out, you need to apply some heat. See, when, when my children walk out and, and they, they close the break, I'm like, put some heat on that. Put some heat on that. Straighten that thing out. Because there are some places and points in your life that will not become alive until God puts some heat on you. And when you look back over, you thank God for the heat which was straightening you out. Tell me, I'm going to bring the iron up to preach next Sunday. So, the Word of God is the seed of repentance. Power of the Holy Ghost, you need that seed. Text is also trained us to teach a teach. That's not just the seed of repentance, but it, let's watch the signs of repentance. Okay. The text says everyone uh, from the least to the greatest 
oldest and youngest, put on sackcloth, which was a sign of mourning. This thing is made of goat's hair, if you will. It's uncomfortable to the skin. When they put on sackcloth, it was their sign of grief and mourning. This suggests, church, that they were having grief over their sin. Yeah. Nobody died, but they were grieving because of sin. That's conviction. Yeah. Yeah. Text says they called out to the Lord. That's confession. Yeah. Text says they changed what they did with their hands. Okay. That's conduct. Okay, why do I want to do really quick? Uh, so so they, they, they put on this sackcloth because they was mourning. That's conviction. Uh, they recognized that my sinful ways have convicted my spirit. Then they, they cried out to God because they had to have a confession. If you confess with your mouth, they understood they had that. But then they changed what they did with their hands, meaning that after conviction and after conviction, conviction and after uh, confession that we ought to have some conduct change. We show up to church on Sunday, on first Sunday, before we take on these creatures of bread and juice. We sit there and we make our declaration. There ought to be a place where we are convicted. We are confessing. But when we leave for the sanctuary, we ought to have a conduct change. These are the components of repentance. Uh, that, that's why uh, my, 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 my dear frat brother, Shane Club, for the Cardinal G. Woodson, established something called Achievement Week. Achievement Week was the birthplace of Black History Month. Because ultimately, he said, there is to be a place and point in our lives where we recall what we've been through. We recall the mistakes that we've made. We recall the areas and places where we've fallen short so that we don't repeat those mistakes. And when we come through to talk about the historical context of coming through Jim and Jane Crow, it's our area of confessing. And after we've confessed, we ought to be changed. The place and point where we have no, uh, no, no, no blame in the situation is over. Each and every one of us have blood on our hands, so the conduct ought to be to produce policies which lend themselves to the least, the lost, and the left out. Yes. Conviction, confession, conduct change. Yes. We look over the course and canvas of our country. There are places where we need a conduct change. When we look at the detriment to our school systems and areas and places, we ought to have a conduct change. When we look at the breakdown of families and family values, we ought to have a conduct change. See, there's a difference between repenting and being sorry. Don't look around and look straight right here. This, this, that one. Most of the time, we just sorry. Because sorry means I regret what was done. But repentance means I'm changing my conduct. Because when you have repented, it means you have changed on the inside, which is called a change on the outside. Repentance is a change of heart that is a result of a change of mind, which produces a change of conduct. We need to repent. I don't need any more sorry for it. I need repentance. Amen. Therefore, the text teaches us that the final sign of repentance is that you're doing something different with your hands. Yeah. It says they stopped their evil conduct, which was in their hands. Now, I'll do the same things I used to do. That there's no reason for me to show up and go to a mission trip and do mission work and still have no compassion for those in need at my home. There ought to be a kind of change. Places and things that you do ought to shift you to a place of gratitude when you look at how blessed you are. There ought to be a kind of change. Okay, uh, that's the seed of repentance, the sign of repentance. Watch here. Number three is the significance of repentance. Watch what they say. I'm around verse number 8 or 9. Check it right there. It says that the king declared the whole region would fast unto God. They said something very interesting in verse number 8 and 9. This is what bothered me. 
He said, hold on. How are we going to know? Who can tell if God will turn away his evil from us yeah. if we repent unto him? Yeah. Watch this. Which means, church, that they repented to God without knowing the certainty of whether he'd be merciful. Well, sure. They said if we repent, there's a possibility that he might not turn, but there's a possibility that he might. I would just do the first step and repent. So they repented. But please take note, their repentance was voluntary. Because I told you that's all the text tells us that Jonah said. Jonah never said, and if you turn from your wicked ways. Jonah said, 40 days y'all dead. <laughs> there was no more given in there. I can't add anything to the text. So that says unto me that their repentance was voluntary because there was no guarantee that changing their behavior would save them from death. They voluntarily repented. They didn't repent with assurity that God was going to veto his burden. But they did it anyways. Because repentance can either produce despondency or repentance can produce possibility. My, my, my son had, had, had mastered this. <laughs> uh, a little different. Um, I can issue a punishment and he, he, he quit the... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes he get bored. I know that nothing is going to change today. <laughs> No, I'm probably not going to be able to go. <laughs> but I wanted you to know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm telling you, that, that's it. That's it. I'm telling you, you know. Uh, uh, I don't know if he's going to change his mind. But I'm going to do it anyway. Because he might just turn it around. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. But it might turn it around. Thus, my brothers and sisters, what they say to God, Say to God is, I don't know if he's going to do it, but he might, because Eric told us he's able. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know if he's going to make it work, yeah. but he might, because he's able. Yeah. I don't know if he's going to heal my body, but he might, because he's able. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to keep this job, but he might. Because he's able. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody ever recognize that I'm so glad that the God I serve is able? Uh, Y'all remember how Abraham went up there? They told him to sacrifice his son. He said, I don't really know how this thing going to work out. But he might. Because he's able. The three Hebrew boys found themselves in a fiery furnace. Showed up in there and said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to bow to you. But if it be the will, he, he going to get us out of the name. One way or another. He might. Because he's able. With God, all things are possible. Now unto him. Who is able. Why you keep praying? You keep praying because he's able. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, we serve an able God. If you drop down, he'll come down. I need you to recognize that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask of the dream. They got down and repented, not sure, but he might. Because they That's God's word for somebody. You've been waiting on God's word. You don't know if he's going to do it, but you do know he might. Because he's able. But some will testify. Not only might he, but did he. Yes. <laughs> somebody tell me now. I, 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 I've helped and, and, and preached that stuff. I, I've been it. Uh, he not only might, but he did it. Yeah. And if he did it before, yeah. he can do it again. Because yeah. he's yeah. yeah. okay. I'm, I'm finished. I'm finished. Uh, uh, text teaches us about the seed of repentance. Text teaches us about the sign of repentance. Text teaches us about the significance of repentance. But I'm going to leave you here with the seal of repentance. It's right there in verse number 10. Verse 10 says, The Lord repented of the evil, and he said he would do unto them, and he did not. 
and he did not. See, this is a challenge for us Old Testament saints because I can see even when, when I was reading this, some of y'all, what do you mean God repented? I don't, I don't like that. I don't like, I, don't like the, I don't like the language. What could God have to repent for? We have to understand that Old Testament saints could not uh, properly or adequately explain uh, what they were trying to insinuate about God. So when you see that word repent in the text, it actually means relent. Yes. Okay, so... So uh, it's hard for us to cultivate repentance with a being that is omniscient. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Repentance insinuates that there's a change of mind. But relentance, uh, that's when you ease up off the gas. Because whatever change is happening, he already knew. But God doesn't repent like we do. The theological application is relenting. When the Bible says God repents, it actually means God is relenting. Relent means he softens his temper and chooses a more compassionate heart. In chapter number 3, when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and tell them in 40 days, the word was always structured not to change God's mind, but to change the people. That's why he gave us time to it. God has a way of structuring your life in such a way that his Word was meant to change you because he knows he's going to relent. He already planned on relenting. He needed you to change first. And as a result of their change, I did not. That's what the text says. Our praise to God is not just based on what God permits. It's predicated on what God prevents. God did not. If anybody's got a testimony, I'm so glad I was driving on the highway. That accident could have been meant for me, but God did not. I heard the diagnosis of the doctor, and even with all of the steps of the gift, I came out with a clean bill of health because God did not. I recognized I was out doing some things I shouldn't have done in some places I shouldn't have been. I should have been dead, sleeping in my brain, but God did not. Is there anybody that wants to shout at the God? But he did not. 
And when he got up, he could have got up powerless, but he got, did not. God got up with all power in his hand to fulfill the purpose in your life. So here's the thing, when you get a one more in, what you going to do with it? God has created an opportunity. I don't know who I'm preaching to, I don't know who this is. But there's somebody who says, you know what? I'm not on my second chance. But I want to acknowledge the God of the second chance that is bringing me into full transparency with him. I, I, I want to acknowledge that God, that the God that, that said, listen, I know you, but I still love you. I know you, but you're still called. I, I get you. I know everything about you, and I love you. Purpose on your life. I have a plan. And here's the thing. You can't sit enough to remove my purpose. So I'm just waiting so I can relent. Just waiting. And you're asking, why have I been going through this? Why, why have this been happening? God said, I've been trying to wait on you to see me. If that's you, you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. Don't miss this opportunity. Yes. The prophet Jonah teaches us about the God of a second chance. And he's bringing back into alignment some things. And that's when God says, listen, I'm calling you. And you feel the heart strings pulling on you. Meet me at this altar. So what I need you to do, is I want you to help me open up the doors of the church. I need you to turn to someone who did not ride in your car, doesn't live in your home. You don't have to ask your name, just read it. Um, after that, would you ask them, are they saved? Second thing, do they have a church home? The answer to either one of those is no. I have to to walk with you. So on the count of three, let's go to work. One, two, three. Let's open up the door. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Father, oh God, we come to you, God, this morning in gratitude, oh God. We thank you for all your blessings, Lord. We thank you for all you've poured into our lives, oh God. Father, we thank you, oh God, for a man like Jonah, oh God. We thank you, O oh God, that we, O oh God, will open our eyes and our hearts to your call, O oh God. And when you call us into ministry, O oh God, that you would answer and that we would do, O oh God, like Isaiah and say, send me, O oh Lord. And Lord, not run from your call, O oh God, but stand before you and say, Lord, send me. Oh, Father, send me, O oh God, with a willing heart, God, because I am going with a willing heart. So we thank you for who you are, for your mercy, for your grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Lord, may the grace of my Lord, Heavenly Father, just send us off this morning, O oh God. Father, as we leave here, we go to our homes. We pray that you will protect us, O oh God, and that you will guide us. You will walk with us, O oh God. O oh Father, may we follow in your footsteps, O oh God. We thank you for who you are. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. It's Pastor Jamin here. Thank you so much for joining us in our worship experience. We pray that something that was said or sung allowed you to feel and experience the love of Christ. We pray God's continued blessing over your life until we meet again. God bless you.